Hello there, and welcome to Fable TLC Cut Content, the series that tries to show you as much content that goes unused relating to Fable to help give you some idea of how different the game could have been. This includes things like weapons, spells, NPCs, creatures, food, potions, augmentations, hero titles, and many more. If this sounds interesting to you, then a link to my playlist on the project can be found in the video description, along with a link to a mod known as The Content Museum, which you are looking at right now, where I try to make some of these things available for other people to play. So if you want to try some of these out for yourself, and don't want to spend the time spawning or rigging everything, then this mod has you covered. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at an older version of the Guild Training Quest. Technically, this would count as multiple quests, and while I do intend to go over how each of the tasks were changed, we'll just lump them all together into one quest and refer to this as the Guild Training Quest, just to make things simpler. As you probably know, the Guild Training Quest is basically the tutorial for the game that acts as a way of teaching players how to defend themselves. This is done by teaching you the three hero disciplines, Strength, Skill, and Will. In the retail game, the way the story goes is like this. You start off with Mayors rescuing you from the raid on Orkville. We must leave. It's not safe here. They're all dead. You don't want to join them, do you? Then give me your hand. My name is Maze, and I'm the head of the Guild of Heroes. You must have heard of it. You'll find nowhere safer in all of Albion, nor a better place to call your home. And if it's vengeance you want, you'll need the training only we can offer. Here we are. I'll introduce you to the Guildmaster. He'll be your guide from now on. This is when he takes you to the Heroes Guild and introduces you to the Guild Master. A new student for you. Put him in the dorm upstairs with the girl. You don't look much like hero material to me, but Maze knows what he's doing, I suppose. Well, follow me then. After you've had time to clear your mind from the PTSD of watching your home get destroyed, and by that I mean one night, <laughs> you end up being taught by the Guildmaster how to inflict damage onto a dummy. After a brief summary on how damage and experience works in the game, the Guildmaster then explains that there are beetles loose in the woods. Sounds like there might be something loose in the woods. This is a good opportunity to test your spirit. I'll wait for you at the Guildwood's entrance, while you deal with the problem. Once you're done, we can talk about starting your training. Well done, lad. The beetles are all dead. You can come out of the woods now. Upon completing this task, you have the real guild training. The melee test against Whisper is your test of strength. Real weapons now. Get used to the weight of this sword, and let's see if you can hit Whisper with it. Come on then, let's see what you've got, farm boy. Ah! Oh, lucky shot. That's all wrong, Whisper. 
You need to practice more. The archery range is your test of skill. To begin with, see if you can hit the three stationary targets. And put some effort into it. The longer you pull back your bowstring, the more damage you will cause. But make sure you stay within the circle. Now, lock onto the target. And the dummies that can be found near the demon door is your test of will. We'll begin by striking these strong dummies with lightning. All right, let's see what you've got. You also get the option to test your new abilities by visiting the different apprentices that are scattered around the guild. These apprentices grade how well you do on each test, and managing to achieve an A plus in each of the disciplines will reward you with more items. All right, you can stop now. That was very impressive. Whisper should be ashamed. A plus. That grade means I can award you a new weapon. Wow! You, you set a new high score! Wow! I ain't never seen any better than that! You got an A plus! The Guildmaster said, if anyone shot brilliant, I could award them this. Whew, that was some fancy shooting. Good hit. Good hit. That's astonishing. Bloody hell, A+. Plus. The Guildmaster said to award these items to anyone who excelled at the will test. I still haven't seen anyone perform better than you. Along with two extra apprentices who have side quests of their own, an apprentice that wants to see if you can beat his record of running to the demon door and back in 50 seconds. Doing so successfully will result in you winning a bet he made with the other apprentice that he is arguing with the whole entire time. Right then, get to the demon door and back and talk to me in 50 seconds. No, you're not. That's amazing! How did you do it? I lost my bet. Then there is the other apprentice who asks if you can kill the sparrows that are cluttering the guild and making it untidy. Both this guy and his quest is referred to as Bird Killer, but it's only accessible during the guild training segment. Those damn sparrows are making a right mess of the guild. Just look at them. I'll pay you five gold for every one you kill. Just come and see me every time you kill another one. Have you killed any more of them? Ah, you've got another. I think that's the last one. Here's a little bonus.
Thanks for getting rid of all those filthy little sparrows. There's also the servant that can be found near the servants' quarter, who asks if you can collect some red apples that are scattered around the guild. Doing this will reward you with the only blueberry pie that can be found in the entire game. Mm, listen, can you help me out? I have to make an apple pie for the guildmaster at the end of the week. But I can't find any more red apples. I only need another four. If you find enough, can you bring them back here? I'll reward you. Thanks. Thank you so much. The guildmaster will get his pie. Here, have this. Once you've finished all your guild training tasks, then you've got Whisper, who asks if you'd like to help her hunt beetles in the guild woods. However, you both realise that there is a group of bandits hanging out behind the river, and decide to take those guys out instead. Very good, lad. You have learnt the three hero disciplines. We can now move on to your final test if you're ready. Or you can spend some more time exploring the guild. I believe Whisper is about to go into the guild woods, if you wish to join her. Come on, let's hunt beetles. I'll follow you into the woods. The beetle nest is just at the top of the... Wait, did you hear that? It's coming from over there. Bandits. If only we could get across that stream. I know. Why don't you use your bow? Or some of that lightning the Guildmaster taught you? I'll heal you if you get hurt. And the last thing that you're able to do is have the option to walk to Mesa's quarters and trigger a cutscene where him and Scythe are discussing a threat in the Northern Wastes, which foreshadows the events that happen in the endgame for the Fable TLC storyline. The journey's length is of no consequence. The Oracle must be protected. How can you be so sure? We might need you here. Who knows what battles we might face? The signs are too strong to ignore, and the Northern Wastes have been too long isolated from the Guild. There is much I may learn there. Well, I hope nobody thinks you're running away from a fight, trying to cheat death again. You know how people talk. Talk is of no matter to me. May death close his eyes to you, Maze. What are you waiting for? Come in! That was Scythe. He was a great hero once, back when he had flesh on his bones and blood in his veins. He's just a shell now. What does he know of the choices we have to make, of what it takes to get things done? Once you have passed each of the hero tests and completed whatever side missions you feel like doing, you are given one final test, which is to enter the guild woods and try to defeat Maze using the skills that you have just learned. The test will be revealed to you there. Good luck. I suppose you're wondering how you pass the final test then. It's simple. You must defeat me, using all you've learned in your years of training. Although he makes it sound like you were going to fight him properly, all he really wants you to do in this version of the game is hit him three times with each of the hero disciplines. 
After you have finished this final test with Maze, the guild ceremony plays out, where Thunder, Maze, and the Guildmaster award you and Whisper with your guild seals. Maze's faith in you was well placed. Now come along. The graduation ceremony will take place in the Chamber of Fate, the oldest part of the guild. Let the apprentices approach. For many years now, you have worked hard to earn yourselves the title of hero. Your choices, whether they lead you down the path of good or evil, will change the face of the world. Now, take your guild seals and venture forth as heroes. This is then followed by a discussion with the Guildmaster, who informs you about how quests are obtained and how you are able to spend experience to improve your character's abilities. On the map table, you will find details of any quests the people of Albion wish heroes to perform. And you'll need to return often to focus all your experience into new skills. Only by doing this regularly will you advance as a hero. Step into the light and I'll show you how to do this. First, you must select the area you wish to advance in. Strength, skill or will. Notice your experience pools in the lower left portion of the screen. You acquire general experience by collecting experience orbs and you automatically acquire strength, skill and will experience by using your abilities in those areas. That being said, there is a lot of data in the game files which support the idea that this whole entire questline was changed significantly before Fable's original release on the Xbox in 2004 for a while. Now there's a whole world for you to explore. To show you how much the Heroes Guild changed during development, let's start this video off from the very beginning. In the early days of Fable's development, the game was originally given the codename of Wishworld. This is the original vision that Dean Carter and his team at Big Blue Box had for the game, all the way back in 1998. More information about Wishworld was brought to light thanks to an interview that the YouTube channel called People Make Games had with the game's managing director called Peter Molyneux. When asked about the Project Ego stage of its development being the original concept for Fable, Peter corrected the horse Chris Bratt by saying that originally the game was meant to be called Wishworld. So they would eventually go on to found their own studio, uh, was it called Blue Box? Yes, Big right? Blue Box. Now this was partly, this was the problem that we had because we can employ people from... Mm -hmm. Oh, from Bullfrog, Bullfrog. yeah, okay. Um, and they're working something that's called Project Ego to begin with? It was called Project Ego. I mean, originally, very originally, it was called Wishworld. Oh, okay, right. And it was about, the, this was the original idea, about having these different wizards that battled away with, against each other. Right, okay. Nothing like yeah. Fable. Got it. Finally. And so then, how, does it, how does it transition then? We had had loads of conversations while we were doing Dungeon Keeper about the perfect roleplaying. After this interview with Peter, People Make Games were able to get in contact with Charlie Edwards, who managed to find a very early build of the game from this period in time. Since the focus of the game had not been truly realised yet, the build is considered flaky and crashes often, but it's a good insight into how much Fable changed over time. Medieval European theme, the very name of the village that we were exploring, but I'd come here hoping to find something else, something surprising. Despite being promised wizards, the character I was controlling looked more like Guybrush Freakwood than Gandalf the Grey, and unless I wanted to crash the game, he could only really manage one spell, a drab looking fight. 
The game was meant to play very differently to the game we are familiar with. Although it did have some RPG elements, it was never the focus for the original game. It was intended to act more like a battle royale game in which players would fight each other as wizards by morphing the environment around them and providing them with bonuses based on the element that player had chosen. So for example, if you chose fire and your opponent chose water, then the way you both changed the environment would have a noticeable difference, leading to various strategies that could be used against each other. The way the Wish World design documents describe this is that, for example, a character like Malachi the Fallen Angel would turn mountains into volcanoes and flat plains into hissing volcanic waste, while a character like Oberon the Fairy King would go around the world creating forests and growing lush vegetation everywhere he goes. I'm guessing this was meant to apply to each of the elements such as earth, fire and water, based on this description. The place that you would train to do this type of environmental morphing was known as the Academy. Unfortunately there is no available images or footage as far as I am aware of, of the Academy ever being implemented into the game. But based on the design document that was put together by Dean Carter, it's assumed to be a building similar to the Heroes Guild that would have trained wizards instead. If you want to hear more about this era of Fable's development, then an amazing video by a YouTube channel called People Make Games was released recently titled Before Fable There Was Wish World. And like I said before, the host of the channel named Chris Bratt had the opportunity to visit some of the game's developers and try out a build of this very early version of Fable. I highly recommend checking it out if you are interested in seeing more about this early development stage, along with Dean Carter describing how he and his team had envisioned Wishworld. Eventually, this vision of the game ended up changing significantly as the team felt that marketing the game as an RPG would help increase the possibilities of it being picked up by a publisher. Since Big Blue Box was still considered an indie studio at the time and was struggling to find someone who would take the risk on their project. This all changed however when the team was picked up by Microsoft and the game slowly transitioned into what became known as Project Eagle. It's during this phase of Fable's development that the Heroes Guild was formed. However, it wasn't a big sprawling school like we are familiar with. Instead, it became more of a small mercenary facility that simply provided heroes with quests and allowed them to train their abilities. While this isn't the earliest version of this type of Heroes Guild, there is footage known as the Fable Giga presentation where Simon Carter and Peter Molyneux had the chance to show the game off to a German audience. In this presentation, they briefly show and explain how the Heroes Guild worked back in 2003. If you would like to see the whole thing, then videos like this are archived over at the Fable Historian's YouTube channel, along with documentaries and interviews related to the game. We're sort of rapid doing our own rap, and you walk into a town like that and, yeah. and people rap. <laughs> anyway, that's just a trivial it's, thing. Yeah, Let's yeah, have, nice. have a look a bit more of a game. That's a nice detail. It's, uh, it's yeah. just... Yeah, I think it's really funny, especially when you walk in and you see this huge dragon and all three of us go, shit! <laughs> and that is just as... Holy moly! Yeah. Now, this is the guild, this is where all the heroes come to get their quests. Okay. There are um, some cool things about the guild. You're, you're, the player comes back here a lot to get uh, new quests all the time. He also comes back here to boast. One of the things you can do, Yay. another thing you can do in the uh, within... Uh, fable is you can get a quest like, for example, well, are there any quests? Uh, uh, there are no quests at the moment. There's one, uh, there's one example where you have to protect this farm. Yeah. You have to protect this farm against uh, the, all these bandits. And you can then stand on this podium and say, right, I'm going to do this without losing any life at all. I'm going to do this without, without uh, any other farmhands dying. So you, what ah. you're doing is saying, not only I'm going to do this quest, I'm going to boast and do it much more, and then your okay. rewards get much higher. But let's ah, just, yeah. from here, you can see that there are a few tourists around. This is one of your followers. 
He's following you around. You're so famous now, you've got a follower. He'll follow you, you around. You have groupies? You have groupies. Perfect. <laughs> but the trouble is, your groupies, you know, they're not fighters. If you go into a dangerous situation, your groupies can get killed. And that's, you know, not so good. But they're always encouraging to do so. Let's go off and do a quest. Can we go off to the, um, maybe do a great, the grave? If you aren't familiar with the Project Eagle era of Fable's development, then allow me to show you a few screenshots of the guild that were also uploaded by the Fable Historian on his Eagle Archivist website. As the name suggests, it's basically the stage where the game's scope was going out of control and the developers were striving to create the best role-playing game that they could ever make. The world had no loading screens, the storyline wasn't the main driving force of the game, multiplayer was being considered, and many more ambitious ideas which never made it into the final game. A few things you may have noticed regardless of if you are aware of Project Eagle or not, is that the Heroes Guild looked a lot smaller and the boasting pedestal was completely different in the Fable Giga presentation. Not only that, but the Heroes Guild shown in these screenshots for Project Eagle also look different to what was seen in the Fable presentation video. This could be because the guild itself went through many stages alongside the game's development and that more than one model was created during this time. The one shown in the Fable Giga presentation that I just showed you only contains one room, while these screenshots clearly show doorways and staircases hinting at other rooms that could be accessed at this point in the game's development. This version of the Heroes Guild is known as the Hero Center. Even the Guildmaster looked completely different back when the game was called Project Ego. He was rocking a monocule and a similar outfit to what he has in the retail game, only the colour scheme for this one gives me vibes of the 1970s, or something like that. Lion Bum, whose real name is Charlie Edwards, who was the lead QA tester for the original Fable and ended up becoming a level designer for Fable 2 and 3, was nice enough to spend the time elaborating on this by saying, Levels and things like the Hero Center are mainly due to the changing nature of the story or world. The idea of going to Hero School came after the Project Ego Hero Center, so it just needed to be a lot bigger, and these were before the world was chopped up into loading zones. According to this description by Lionbum, we can assume that the Hero Center went through different stages as the game was developed, which would explain all the screenshots that can be found for Project Ego that also suggest this. Not only that, but elements such as the story and maps intended for the Heroes Guild changed as the game was slowly forming into the fable we have come to know and love. Then there is Dean Carter himself, one of the co-creators for Fable, who goes by the username of Fluttermind on Discord, which is also the name of his new studio. He explained to me that back in this era of Fable's development, most of the game was meant to be procedurally generated, including the game's narrative. The original Hero Center was most likely the driving force behind this system by allowing you to pick a variety of quests that were generated by the game, unlike the retail game which has the same quests and the same overall storyline already determined for you every time you start a new game. This along with many other features in the game ended up being simplified due to the technical limitations and time constraints. Now that I have explained to you everything I can find about the Hero Center, I have something exciting which I can share with you. Thanks to my friend who is a user by the name of Albion Secrets, we can actually view one of these Hero Center models in the game. This mod can be found on his Project Seasons Discord server or over at the Fable TLC Nexus mod page. What he managed to do was extract the Hero Center model from the Xbox version of Fable. Then he imported it into Fable TLC, changed some things around so it works and doesn't crash the game, and then turned it into a mod for people to download. So if you'd like to try this out for yourself, links will be in the description. As you can probably tell, this seems to be the same one that can be seen in the Fable Giga presentation that I showed earlier on in this video. 
Despite having the upstairs map room with the rounded windows, it's actually not possible to enter it normally in this version of the Hero Center. Not only is it blocked off by a sign that says keep out, but the floor itself is hollow. The only room you are meant to access is the downstairs portion, which includes the leaderboard that is combined with a fireplace, a chandelier that I don't believe is used anywhere else in the game, and a bookcase which was probably used for spending your experience in each of the respective hero disciplines. Finally, there appears to be a colour skate, but since I only have the model for the building, it doesn't actually work. So what I did was add a solid object underneath the floor that you were supposed to stand on for the map room, and then I added a teleport system to enable me to enter the upstairs portion of this building. This gives us a good view of the stairs and the map room. I'm sure I read somewhere that a developer said, this building ended up being recycled for Maze's quarters, which makes sense because the buildings do look very similar. The model that I have just shown gameplay footage for could have been one of the oldest versions of this hero center, as it only has one main room and the room upstairs doesn't even have physics to allow the player or an NPC to stay in there, which suggests that it was never meant to be accessible, while the screenshots for Project Ego suggest that the hero center building was meant to be a little bit bigger in scale, with plenty of doors, a spiral staircase, and even a balcony. The original boasting podium, on the other hand, can still be found in the game files of Fable TLC for some reason. I'm assuming there is a reason behind it, as a lot of other guild assets were completely removed from the game. Along with these boasting podium drums, which are these weirdly shaped objects that you can interact with to accept a boast while on top of the podium. It's also possible to find a trigger for the boasting pedestal inside of the game files, which looks exactly like a teleporter or colour skate. I'm guessing this was meant to act as a way for the developers to test the boasting system without actually needing the podium itself, since it's not used in the retail game. Here is how the podium and the drums look in the retail game. By swapping out the podium that's still in the game with the original boasting pedestal, it'll work perfectly fine, since all the markers will still be there for the boasting pedestal. Although the pedestal itself does have issues with physics if you try walking around it. Now if I go to accept a quest, I'll be able to show you what the boasting podium drums are like. something good. Hurrah! Yeah! Nice work. What's up? No boasting. 
Sounds tricky. Hey! Oh, yes! This leads us to Fable, the game we know and love. However, what a lot of people don't really seem to realise is that Fable itself also had its own sort of beta phase, if you can call it that. Before the game was released, where it still had some Project Ego elements to it, but it was rebranded to the new name Fable. Though the game was shortened significantly, they still tried to be more ambitious with what they had. This led to a lot of experimentation with the game that can still be found in the game files, such as Trogdor the Dragon that was cut from Fable on the Xbox in 2004, which I recently made a video on if you are interested to know what that is about. This period of the game's development was probably the messiest, involving a lot of crunch time to get the ideas for Fable finished and pressed onto a disc. It's possible some of these changes were the result of testing the game, but a lot of them appear to be very drastic changes, like this first bit of evidence that I'm going to talk about, and which I believe to be the earliest idea for the guild training segment of the game. Did you know that the guild training segment of the game was originally meant to play out in a cave? If you've ever modded or checked the game files before, you might be aware of a few unused assets that contain the name of Stealth and Challenge. I find the easiest way to find them all is to type in Challenge. For those who haven't, here is a little demonstration of me showing off the assets I'm talking about and putting them together to make the map that I think it was intended for by using a modding program known as Chocolate Box. Once I'm done building, I will go into the game and show you how it looks. Due to their name and how much these objects tend to tie together, I refer to them all as Stealth Challenge Cave. The first object that we have here is called Challenge Stealth Chamber Light. I'm not exactly sure why light is in the name, even though it is clearly the interior of a cave. Perhaps it's referencing something that's supposed to happen in this area. The cave is very long, which is why I'm using Lookout Point to demonstrate all of this. It looks really simple when you view it in Chocolate Box, but all of the walls are supposed to have markings on them in the game, kind of like hieroglyphics. If we go back to our list of objects named Challenge, you will also find something called Challenge Ceiling Lamp, which is sort of like a black caged lamp or lantern. I'm not too sure where exactly these are supposed to be placed inside of here, but I always feel like they fit perfectly on the archways that can be found near the entrances to the cave. This was probably used to light up the area, since the original map would be a cave. After that, we have two different types of rubble objects. These were probably scattered around the map to help make it feel more cluttered, rather than having all this free space. Again, I'm not too sure where exactly everything is supposed to be placed, I'm just trying my best to demonstrate it. Next up is this weird light effect that for some reason is an object. It's called Light Shaft, so I'm guessing there was meant to be some kind of opening somewhere, and this would have helped to give the illusion that light was entering the cave. With the way the model is positioned upon inspecting it, you would assume that perhaps it was meant to shine from above, but the cave itself does not have any kind of opening on the ceiling leading me to assume that this was either meant for the challenge ceiling lamp, or that this wasn't the only cave that they planned for this area. And finally, we have a bunch of objects that seem to have been created to act as ways of training your skills. These are the gem plinths, 
which seemed to be these weird pillars that were meant to train either your strength or skill abilities, similar to the training dummies that can be found in the retail game. My theory is that you had to hit them, but I really don't know much else about them. However, what I do find weird about them is that with the way the squares are designed, it seems that they are meant to stay attached to the floor, yet the plinth has an entire column that goes further down, even though you aren't meant to see it, which is really strange. The only thing I can say to answer for this is that perhaps the map was designed in a way where you could see the rest of the design for these pillars, but based on what I know, this part just seems pointless. Now we have the set of pieces that make up a trench. Placing them on the floor will fix them to the ground, which means that it was probably meant to be placed that way in an area that had terrain missing. This is because if you examine both of these trench pieces, you'll notice that there is a 2D lava texture, which I'm guessing was meant to symbolize the fact that if you fall off, then you're probably going to die. There are two pieces for this trench, an ending which is meant to be placed on both sides of the trench, and then a middle piece that they use to extend the length of the trench. Though we aren't completely finished yet with Stealth Challenge Cave, there is one final object that is related to this particular area, which is that these trenches are meant to have buzz saws attached to them. I'm not sure if it was meant to be one buzz saw that moved up and down the trenches, or if it was meant to be multiple buzz saws that stayed fixed to the same spot, but either way, there is unfortunately no animations for it in the game files. Since everything is now set up, let's take a look at how the cave might have looked when viewing it in the game. Bear in mind that I'm using the lookout point map and not an actual cave map to demonstrate all of this.
Ah, there is an important quest card at the guild for you. Some more assets that can be found in the game files which could have involved this area are these strange rock creatures. One is just made out of stone, while the other has lava spewing out of its eyes and mouth. I remember this being a pretty horrific sight the first time I stumbled upon it. For some reason they have a guild seal at the top of their model, which I'm guessing is because they were supposed to defend some area inside the guild. If you spawn them into the game, then they just play this weird bobbing animation in a loop, which is known as the rising animation. And sometimes the physics of their environment can cause them to go out of control because of this. They have other animations left in the game files too. Here is a demonstration of each animation with the use of Fable Explorer. I wanted to use the lava cube since it's more obvious where parts of its face are, but unfortunately the lava cube doesn't react to the animations when viewing its model in Shadownet, so instead we're just going to have to use the normal rock cube. The animations for it which are still left in the game are rising, spin fast, spin slow, spin stop, and destroyed. As you can tell from the clip when I spawned in the creatures, the rising animation was most likely its idle animation, when the creature had no tasks to perform and is waiting around to be attacked. The spin fast, spin slow and spin stop animations could have been used for two things. It could have been an animation that the creature used when talking to the player, perhaps during a cutscene, or it could have been animations that were created to act as attack animations. My theory is that the cube was meant to spin and when it stopped it ahead, perhaps it shot some kind of magic or fireball spell at the player. But there's nothing else really to prove that this is the case. And finally, you have the destroyed animation, which is pretty straightforward. When the cube was ready to die, this animation would have played. I'm guessing they were meant to explode or something similar to rock trolls, but no actual death animation exists for them, probably because they were never finished. And last but not least for Stealth Challenge Cave is the strange object known as Stealth Box. Spawning it into the game does nothing and you can't interact with it, but if I had to guess it must have been planned for some kind of puzzle involving your stealth or skill abilities.
Here are some images which you can tell by the watermarks were uploaded by IGN, which show an unused cave area that looks awfully similar to the assets used for this cave. They aren't the same assets, but they do bear a striking resemblance. Perhaps this was a later attempt at the same idea before they ended up scrapping it. Based on more evidence that can be found in the game, it seems that once they decided to scrap the idea of you doing your training inside of a cave, a lot of the guild training segment was moved to the guild woods instead. On top of this, it appears that during this period of the game's development, Mears might have been more involved in your training. I suppose you're wondering how you pass the final test then. It's simple. You must defeat me using all you've learned in your years of training. If you're subscribed to the channel, then you might have seen my content restoration videos that I've been making recently. These are cutscenes that I've edited or created to help demonstrate and recreate certain aspects of cut content. One of the first things I tried doing was restoring removed dialogue from existing cutscenes. Each cutscene that you view in the game is a compilation of commands that compiled into a script and executed after certain goals and triggers are met in the game. Whenever you analyse these scripts, you might notice a pattern amongst the dialogue that is used. By analysing this pattern, you can find numbers which are left out. This isn't always the case, since not all of the dialogue intended for these cutscenes is left in the game files, but a surprising amount of it is still there. Our first cutscene for this quest is called Guild Arrival, and it's the cutscene that plays when Maze takes you to the Heroes Guild after saving you from the raid on Orkville. It's possible that more dialogue was removed from this cutscene, but in the game files, one more line of dialogue can still be found. Here is how it sounds if you try to put it back into its intended cutscene. Hmm, I thought you'd have a stronger stomach than that. Come on. <sighs> Save your energy, boy. It's not me you want to fight. You might not realize it, but I just saved your life. There's nothing left for you in Oakvale, and if you'd stayed, you'd be as dead as the rest of them. Come with me. My name is Maze, and I'm the head of the Guild of Heroes. You must have heard of it. Those who live here are granted sanctuary and learn the ways of the hero. You'll find nowhere safer in all of Albion, nor a better place to call your home. And if it's vengeance you want, you'll need the training only we can offer. Here we are. I'll introduce you to the Guildmaster. He'll be your guide from now on. If you go into the text.big for the retail game and try to look for dialogue related to this quest, you will slowly notice that a lot of dialogue for the Guildmaster actually use Maze in the title. A few examples I was able to find are Maze Bad Hit and Maze Good Hit, which are actually dialogue for the Guildmaster talking to you about how well you are shooting arrows at the training dummies during the archery test. Then there is Mayor's Block and Mayor's Help Attack, which is actually dialogue for the Guildmaster talking to you during the melee training test with Whisper. This could hint at two things. Either you were meant to originally test your skills against Mayor's to pass your training in certain disciplines, such as melee and archery, or that Mears was originally meant to say this dialogue, meaning that Mears was meant to teach you the three hero disciplines instead of the Guildmaster. Going back to the unused cutscenes, have you ever noticed that on every day of your guild training, Whisper wakes you up early? 
except for the final day when you graduate. The final day for the guild training segment is called Departure in the game files. Based on some unused dialogue that I could find, it seems that the developers did plan for Whisper to wake you up on the final day of your training, but they didn't implement it into the game. This is because no markers can be found on the map to support this cutscene, just dialogue. So I recreated the cutscene using the dialogue that I could find. Here is how it may have looked. It's possible that this played before the cutscene with the Guildmaster as soon as you woke up. Still asleep? I was awake all night. All these years training, and it comes down to one day. Crazy, isn't it? Listen to me going on. I'm sure we'll both be fine. Come on, we better get moving. Not only was that cutscene with Whisper removed, but it appears that the Guildmaster's dialogue after that was also changed before the game was released. Based on his dialogue, the final day would have consisted of doing tests for each of the hero disciplines that were provided by the apprentices, and that you needed to achieve at least a C in one of those disciplines to move on to your final test. Today is your final day at the Guild. This is the day you graduate. Visit the three apprentices and then come back to me. If you have achieved at least a C in at least one discipline, you will be eligible to attempt the final test. You will be rewarded if you perform any test well, so put some effort into it. There is an unused object in the game files called Guild Melee Combat Ring, which could have been intended for the area where you train your melee abilities against Whisper. When viewing the object in Chocolate Box or Shadow Net, it has this design that matches the walls which surround the combat ring and fits perfectly in the intended spot for the retail game. However, viewing it in the game actually reveals that it has a red carpet design that covers the top of the combat ring. To me, this matches the design of the boasting podium that can be found outside the guild in the retail game. This was probably removed not long before the game's release, and if I had to guess, it was removed because they added walls to prevent the hero from leaving the area when they are doing their tests. There was even dialogue and a cutscene that appears to go unused once you completed the will training section with the Guildmaster. In this alternative cutscene, Whisper would interrupt you and the Guildmaster so that she can ask if you would like to go hunt beetles with her in the Guildwoods. You can keep that lightning spell, but mind what you do with it, it's not a toy. We can now move on to your final test if you're ready. Or you can spend some more time exploring the guild. Learned how to use your willpowers yet? Ah, there you are, Whisper. Yes, this boy is on his way to becoming a true hero now. Although he still needs to learn to control his powers. 
you should watch how a real hero does it. Follow me to the Guildwoods. Come on, it'll be fun. Oh, and when you finish playing with Whisper, come and see me in the map room. Speaking of beetles in the Guild Woods, did you know that the markers for the beetles that you fight during the start of the Guild Training Quest are actually called Scorpion Markers, and that there is evidence to support the idea that at one point in development, the plan was to allow you to enter the Guild Woods and fight off a batch of scorpions instead of beetles? It's possible that this was replaced with either the beetles that you hunt at the start of the game, or the little side mission where Whisper asks you to hunt down beetles in the retail game. This is further supported by dialogue from a text.big file that can be found in an older build of the game, which is another thing by Albion Secrets that you can find on his Project Seasons Discord server. It appears there was a guard that was removed from the game who would stand outside of the Guild Woods and only allow people to enter if they got permission from the Guild Master first. He is often referred to as Woods Guard in the text.big file. This was discovered by another friend of mine called GameGenie87, who helped me compile all of this dialogue for the guild's Wood Guard so that I could make cutscenes based off them. In this dialogue, the guard will introduce himself, reject entry if you don't have permission from the guildmaster, and finally, he will allow you entry to kill the scorpions. In the lines of dialogue where he mentions the scorpion hunting task, he states that it's not possible to reach the scorpion queen yet, and so you have to kill its babies instead. If you failed to do so, then the task would be given to Whisper instead. I always assumed that perhaps the scorpion queen was cut content for the arena, but no, it turns out it was actually intended for your guild training. Here are some cutscenes I made to demonstrate the guild woods guard and his dialogue. Unfortunately, his dialogue has no audio because there's no way to extract it from another version of the game. Now for an edit of the Woods Will Test cutscene where Whisper takes you to hunt beetles. I used this to demonstrate how the scorpion hunting quest may have turned out, based on the dialogue that I just showed you. Again, since I can't edit the audio, Whisper will refer to the enemies as bandits, even though they are clearly scorpions. The beetle nest is just at the top of the... Wait, did you hear that? 
It's coming from over there. Bandits. If only we could get across that stream. I know. Why don't you use your bow? Or some of that lightning the Guildmaster taught you? I'll heal you if you get hurt. You received a new quest card. We did it! Did you see the look on their faces? Wait till the Guildmaster hears about this. You might be thinking to yourself, surely there can't be more of this stuff, right? Well, yes, there actually is. Based on more dialogue that was scooped up by Albion Secrets, it turns out that Mears had a task where he would hide a lamp somewhere in the Guild Woods. Similar to the retail game, the Guildmaster would inform you that you have to go into the Guild Woods because they've hidden a lamp there. So then, you go into the woods to look for it. During your search, you stumble upon a man who was known as the Lamp Thief. He would try to convince you that he watched Mears hide the lamp and that he has the one that you were looking for. It seems that you were able to accept his offer by paying 50 gold pieces, refuse his offer and come back to him later, or threaten him to cough up the lamp with no cost. Since the quest probably wasn't finished, it's not made clear on if the lamp thief is actually lying to you, or if there were any repercussions for not buying his lamp or threatening him. After all, the Lamp Thief himself could be a test. Here are some cutscenes I made to demonstrate the Lamp Thief's dialogue. Similar to the Guild Woods Guard, it can only be found in an early version of the game, so there's no audio for this one either. Once you find the lamp or retrieve it from the lamp thief, you will encounter Mears, just like in the retail game, who would be your final test. Mears would point out that you managed to get past some beetles and find the lamp he hid. This could mean that this version of the guild training was a later version to the Scorpion Queen quest, since he only mentions the beetles. It appears he also had a different voice actor back when this dialogue was recorded. Hmm, you got past the beetles then, and I see you have the lamp I hid. I thought I secreted it pretty well. 
I suppose you're wondering how you pass the final test then. It's simple. You must defeat me, using all you've learned in your years of training. Unlike the retail game, talking to Maze must not have been a forced cutscene, as he even has dialogue for attacking him before talking to him about the final test. Here is how that might have looked. Ah, you seem to know why I'm here. <laughs> well, you got the first hit in, but that'll be your last. The final thing that we have to look at relating to the guild training quest is the bird killer that I mentioned at the start of the video. This is the guy who pays you to kill sparrows for him during the start of the game. If you open up the cutscene scripts and try to find the one for his quest, you will notice that's actually named Guild Goals Intro, rather than something like Guild Sparrow Intro, for example. This implies that instead of sparrows, the original target was meant to be seagulls that were scattered around the guild and making it untidy. In an older version of the text.big file like I mentioned before, it's possible to find dialogue for the bird killer that backs up this theory where he would ask you to kill those scorn loving seagulls instead of sparrows. This makes a lot more sense as seagulls are actually messy birds unlike a sparrow. I need someone to kill the sparrows nesting around the guild. Disgusting vermin. Those damned sparrows are making a right mess of the guild. Just look at them. I'll pay you five gold for every one you kill. Just come and see me every time you kill another one. Can't you find it in there? They're all over the room. Killed any of the blighters yet? I believe that finally covers everything I could find information about related to the Heroes Guild and the Guild Training Quest. Hopefully you enjoyed your time watching this video, and if you'd like to see more videos like this one, then check the description of this video to find a playlist to my Fable TLC cut content series, along with links to mods, other people who helped me make this video, and my Discord server where you can chat with people who are also interested in Fable and its cut content.